you know. And but at the same time, do I do I bind up my heart to another human being and not do something for them when I can? How hateful would that be? How would I deny Christ by not doing that? I couldn't pray at night. I couldn't ask God to bless anything I had. And I'm just being honest because it's the truth. Our culture sucks. Our communities are broken. Our fellowship with Christ is based upon meeting our own needs and not the needs of other people. And it's sin. And it has to stop. There is no hope for the body of Christ. If we're always looking out for ourselves, if we're so inwardly focused that we don't know how to sacrifice and put ourselves on the altar for Christ. Brotherlamps.com Dear and Father, thank you so much for your love and many blessings. Thank you for blessing us, being with us, blessing our health, helping us through all those trials and tribulations and struggles we have in life and all the things that annoy and just come against us to try to wear us down and zap our happiness and joy and energy and uh, just taking the joy of life away from us at times. So we, we repeat it all in the name of Jesus Christ and help us to uplift and build one another up in our brotherly love Bible study. Give us the Holy Spirit, guide us on your truth, and thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Interesting enough, we did the uh, fasting this week for Angel, which was a perfect example of brotherly love. So faith in action for sure. And so this one I started when we didn't have Bible study last week. And I was like, well, this is getting too good. So I'd rather do it as a Bible study f with the group. And uh, and so it kind of covers a big range of topics. The first part is really it's like two Bible studies. You know, and so it's really for everybody. It's for me. It's for you. It's for everybody in our group because we all deal with this in a certain level. And so we have to uh, be willing to be teachable by God, as we did in our Bible study last week, to be wrong about a certain thing so we can, can grow, you know. And so this Bible study is based upon loving one another, building each other up and uh, doing it God's way, basically. So we'll read at the top says focus reference at the top and says i give you a new commandment that you love one another as i have loved you you should also love one another by this all shall know that you are my disciples if you have love towards one another john 13 34 through 35 right so the predominant characteristic is if you say you're a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, the predominant characteristic Jesus says the world will differentiate us from the world is our love for one another, right? And so if we don't have this love and if that love isn't put into action, right, then the world won't see the difference in us. And if the world isn't seeing the difference in us, then we don't bear the fruit and, and the light that will draw them to Christ through our example. Right. Because we're disciples. We're baby Christians, you know. And so, I mean, uh, baby Christ, because that's why we get Christians. Right. We're supposed to be like Jesus. So we're going to start off with this top verse. It says we are one. We cannot neglect the needs of each other without hurting ourselves. Right. And this whole first section of our Bible studies fighting and tearing down the Western mindset that we have in our culture. Right. And so what we have to do is just remember that, like, we have a, a, a battle going on. And so as long as we understand that there's a battle and we can fight against it, then we're going to win. So that's right. It says, for as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body being many are one body. So also is Christ for in one spirit. We're all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether bond or free, what. We're all given to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one is not one member, but many. If the foot would say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not the part of the body, it is not therefore not part of the body. If the ear would say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not part of the body, it's not therefore not part of the body. If the whole body were an eyeball, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he has desired. If they were all one member, we would. Uh, where would the body be? But now they are many members, but one body. 
So the eye can't tell the hand, I have no need for you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need for you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. They, those parts of the body which we think be less honorable, on those we bestow more abundant honor. And on our unpresentable parts have more abundant propriety. Whereas our presentable parts have no such need. But God composed the body together, giving more abundant honor to the inferior parts that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or when mem one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ a mem and, and members individually. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. So let me paraphrase because it kind of goes weird on it. It sounds in, in your head when you read it, it's kind of like it becomes a mess. Basically, my hand can't tell my face I don't need you. My foot can't tell my arm I don't need you. Representing the Bible, the body of Christ. So I can't say, Chad, we don't need you. I can't, and Chad can't be like, well, I don't need you. Right? And so we need each other. So, Sarah, you need this body of Christ. And, Joanna, you need it, too. We all need all of our parts to work together, right? And so God has brought the body of Christ to fulfill their function and their design and their spiritual gifts, right, and their spiritual offices. And so we cannot neglect the needs of each other without hurting ourselves, right? And so we have to keep it in mind that, like, anything that hurts me is hurting you. Anything that hurts you is hurting me. And I have to take it as such. I can't sit back and let you hurt without being involved in your life to help make it better. Same thing for you guys. You can't, can't do it to each other. We can't ignore one another. We can't be so wrapped up in our own stuff that we don't we neglect each other. It's not the way of Christ. So let's read. Love by its very nature is sacrificial. The way of the world is to seek your own good and happiness. After fulfilling your own desires, if you have anything left, then give some of that. But only after self-fulfillment. God's way is to seek the benefit of others first and trust God to fulfill your needs and desires. To sacrificially give of your mental, emotional, spiritual energies, sharing your time, your talents, your earthly goods, your wealth, and your wisdom to the benefit of the body of Christ. This is sacrificial love. Right. So we live in a world and a culture, especially the Western mindset, which we're going to tackle hardcore here in a minute, that it's basically go get yours. Right. And God's way is go give yours. Right. It's two different ways of thinking about life. Right. And God, it's not that God doesn't want us to be prosperous. Doesn't He doesn't want us to invest our time in the activities and energies. He just wants us to have our priorities, our ducks in a row. Right. And so here we're going to start at the top of page two. It says the hit list. Okay. The following is a hit list of verses that help us realign our thoughts and hearts to the will of God. We must learn if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. And so these verses we're about to read is really going to not mesh very well with uh, Western culture, right? With the individualistic mindset that is being preached in our society, right? And because it's dog eat dog, climb the ladder, climb over people to climb that ladder, right? And do whatever is, for you, is best for you. This is not God's way. Ever, never will be. It's not his way, right? And so, and we learn this in Jesus Christ. So let's start with the first one. It says, do not seek your own good, but the good of the other person, First Corinthians 10, 24. So what does that mean? That means if I need to always be outwardly focused, you're going to hear me say outwardly focused a lot in this Bible study because that's brotherly love. We have to always be outwardly focused. Okay. So, so the Bible says, do not seek your own good, but seek the good of the other person. Right. And so we always have to be in a mindset is what's best for my brothers and sisters in Christ, for my wife and my children, right? We always, and my friends, we always have to be outwardly focused, right? And that's hard to do. It's hard for me to do. It's hard for everyone to do, right? Because it's not in our nature, right? It, our nature is survival. It's self-fulfillment. It's to do whatever we can for ourselves to make ourselves happy because in this Western culture, nobody else is going to make you happy. Make yourself happy, right? But this is not God's way. So the next one we read, each counting others better than himself. Each of you not just looking at his own things, but each of you also to the things of others. Philippians 2, 3b through 4, right? So we have to count each other better than ourselves. That you know, like Cody, he is better than me. In my paradigm, I have to look at Cody and go, Cody, you are more important than me. I have to invest into you, 
right? I have to invest into this group. I have to invest in my wife. In other words, I'm outwardly focused. Not that I'm not important, but God's way is to be outwardly focused and let him take care of you, right? And, but and if everybody got to the point where they're all inwardly focused and, and, and looking at self, then everybody's running around doing their own program. And this is not God's way. So let's read the num next one. And the love of the brothers be tenderly affectionate to one, or, uh, one another and honor preferring one another, Romans 12, 10. So I'm supposed to prefer you. This is a good example. You're at potluck, you're about to have some food and there's only one slice of cake left, right? It's human nature to run over there before somebody else who's about to grab it and grab your cake, right? But the Bible, that no, the Bible says, no, you don't do that. You leave the cake. You let somebody else have the cake. Now, it's just a small example, but we have to do that in everything we do, right? In all of our decision makings on how we interact with one another. We're supposed to exalt, lift up, and prefer, right? Think be people better better than yourselves, right? And, and in this, it creates an environment that they start doing it too, right? And we're going to cover that in a little bit. And so I'll regress on that one. So next one, bear one another's burdens. And so you will fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. How often in life, the burdens of life get so hard. They get so tough and, and just overwhelming that we get so inwardly focused on our own troubles, our own pains, our own sh our situations, right? But Jesus and God tells us, listen, bear one another, bur each other's burdens, right? Take on a responsibility that is not yours, right? Be outwardly focused. Go in and, and, and line up next to somebody and go, we got this, brother. We're, we're in this together, right? Because that's what would please God, right? And so what we don't realize is it seems like such a, such a, a foreign thing to do. It's like, I can barely wake up in the morning myself. How am I supposed to go help in, anybody else? But we, it breaks a spiritual bondage, right? Because when you're looking inwardly, you can feel like you're looking in a box with no way out. But if you look at help with somebody else, somebody else's problems, you can see opportunities and ways out that they might not be able to look at. And guess what? They can do it for you, too. And that's the point. And God knows this. And that's why he tells us. OK, next one. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek the good uh, to do good one to another and to everyone. First Thessalonians 515. Right. So we're not supposed to pay evil for evil. So if anybody in this group ever does anything to hurt, harm or forsake or frustrate one another, we're not supposed to turn around and slap back. Right. We're not supposed to go and kick each other in the shins because I got kicked in the shins. Right. In other words, what is that saying? It's saying take the hit. Someone has to stop the cycle. Right. And so we somebody has to take a hit in marriage. Somebody has to take a hit in friendship. Someone has to take the hit in business. Someone has to take the hit. someone anywhere. Somebody has to take the hit. Right. And just stop it. And so especially like in business, when you have management where they say the buck stops here, the boss. Right. Someone's taking the hit, heat. Someone's taking the pain and suffering of a bad decision made. All right. And so as Christians, God wants us to do this. He wants us to take the hit. Right. And to look past and or, or over an offense. Right. And just move forward because spiritually somebody has to break the cycle. And so if someone if like if I slap you, you know, if I slap Daniel, Daniel slaps Angel, Angel slaps Chad, Chad slaps Cody, Cody slaps Joanna. Somebody has to stop the slapping. Right. And so Joanna has to be like, I'm not going to turn around and inflict the pain that was inflicted on me. I'm stopping it here. This is we're done. Right. And so we have to be that way. We have to take the hit. Next one. Um, and submitting to one another out of reference for Christ. Ephesians 521. What does it mean to submit? That means that like everybody wants to be the captain of their own ship. Everybody wants to have the say. Everybody wants to be the influential one. Everybody has a, a seed of selfishness in them where they want their way. Right. I do. Everyone does. It's in our nature because we have a sin nature. But Christ is overriding our sin nature and the power of the Holy Spirit to give us a new nature, to be new creatures. And so what we have to do is submit to each other. In other words, not try to exalt ourselves or lift ourselves up in front of people. Right. To be able to, to be the lowly one, to be the servant, the one again that takes the hit, the one that will be. Okay, we don't have to do it my way. The example, you got three people in the car, everybody's trying to figure out where to go eat. You could be the one that goes, whatever you guys want, I'm good. But I'm, I'm just happy to be hanging out with you, right? Small example, but it, it magnifies in life and a lot of things, right? All right, next one. For you, brothers, we're called for freedom. 
Only don't use your freedom for gain to the flesh, but through love be servants to one another. Galatians 5.13. Last one is Ephesians 5.21. And this is Galatians 5.13. And so what does it say? We have to be servants. I'm here to serve you, right? We're here to serve each other. We're here to do the things that nobody wants to do, the things that's so contrary to our own desires and nature that like it almost frustrates us to even think about having to do it. Right. And so we have to be able to go, listen, I will take the hit. I will submit to you. I will think you're better than me. I will exalt you up. Right. But re let's read the next one. But it is not this way with among you, it says. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first among you must be the slave of all. Mark 10, 43 through 44, words of Jesus. So what he's saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, if you want to up your stock in God's sight, in God's eyes, in your value to the body of Christ, he's saying, debase yourself, lower yourself, be the servant. That's what he did. You know, he washes Peter's feet and Peter's like, oh, no, don't let it be this way. And Jesus is like, you don't understand, dude. I have to do this. This is how the kingdom of heaven works. Those who have the most power, authority, and control must submit themselves to the benefit of other people, not exalt themselves up. Not try to hoard it over people, lord it over them, can, you know, get what they want. That's what you see in society. That's where you see people right in the food chain. That's what you see in businesses, right? Where everybody uses their power and authority to just keep piling more towards themselves. This is not God's way. Can't be this way in the body of Christ. I'm here to be your servant. And if you're in the right spirit with God, you're here to be my servant. And guess what, guys? It, it creates a beautiful environment of fellowship. And the ability to look out for one another, to have each other's backs, to know that like, you know what, you know, uh, Sarah has my best interest at heart. I know she, I can trust her. She she's looking out for me. Right. And I could do the same thing that like, hey, I'm looking out for you guys. Right. And so in this, this is brotherly love. Next one. By this, we know uh, we know love that he laid down his life for us and we have to lay down our lives for the brothers. First John three sixteen. What does that mean to lay down your life? What, what, how does that apply? How does that look for us? It looks like this, guys. That means I put you first, right? If if you have a need and I can meet that need, I need to meet that need. Period. That's it. If you need help and I can help, I need to help, right? There's no get out of jail free card. Now, it's not wrong to get time away or have a vacation or anything like that to get to repower yourselves. But your lifestyle is outwardly focused. You're always looking towards the people around you as how can I serve you? How can I love you? How can I shoulder your burdens? How can I lighten your burdens? How can I come alongside you and encourage you and lift you up? Right? This is the only way to be happy, I promise. It sounds so counterintuitive because the world teaches you possessions and status brings happiness. It doesn't. You know, how many rich people commit suicide? Because once they get to the top, Tom Brady, right? He just retired, football guy. He won like, he's been seven Super Bowls, something like this, something ridiculous. You know what he said about Super Bowls? He said, I thought it would be different. It just basically, he said it felt empty. And he thought there would be more to it, but there's not. So people, I've seen videos online, millionaires. They get their first million. They say, I got to the top of the hill. All I looked is for the next million. And I got to the top of that hill, and then there was another million. And then they basically said it got to the point where nothing mattered. Nothing made me happy. There was no joy in anything because nothing fulfilled. The only thing that fulfills is loving each other. I promise you. Jesus knew that. The disciples knew that. That's the only thing that fulfills. That's the only thing that will bring you happiness. That will be the only thing that will bring you joy in this life is to love each other in the power of God and have a relationship with Jesus Christ and God and love your fellow man. That's why you can go to foreign countries that people are dirt poor living in houses as happy as ever. I watch uh, Global Missions. Uh, glo uh, I think it's Global Visions. Um, and they go to these poor places. These people have one set of clothes. They live in a hut, dirt floor. Kids are happy. Wife's happy. Husband's happy. Life's good. It's only in America, which we're about to talk about, that this, this ridiculous pressure comes upon us. Right. And it, success is not the problem. God wants us to be successful. He'll bless our work. He'll bless our endeavors. Right. The problem is, is where we put it in the pecking order of our lives. And so we have to make sure that nothing we do gets in, way, our, in the way of our love for God and our ability to love each other, to take care of each other. Because I'm telling you guys, there's nothing else that will bring you joy and happiness. Right. 
It's the con- you were made to run on relationship. You were made in the garden. Adam and Eve were made to have a relationship, to have children, to have a relationship with God. That has not changed. It's relationship that will bring you happiness. It's people that will help bring you joy, purpose, and meaning. Nothing else. Okay? So let's read. Okay, so this is going to get kind of intense. As if what I just said wasn't intense enough, this next part is going to smash the, the Western mindset. Okay? And so let's read. The world teaches us selfishness in everything. It tries to convince us that it's okay to have others do for us what we are unwilling to do for us, for them. The consumption, corruption of the world will lead anyone under its spell to devour themselves on the altar of self-gratification. And this is not God's way. This is not the example given to us by Jesus. If you want to find peace, purpose, joy, happiness, meaning, defeat depression, hopeless, hopelessness, and confusion, we must be outwardly focused. Jesus exemplified this sacrificial lifestyle to all, uh, for all Christians to follow. We cannot exalt ourselves without lowering everyone else down. We must lower ourselves down so we can raise everyone else up. You will not find a single verse in scriptures that teaches us to seek out our own fulfillment over that of the people in our family, church, and friends. God wants us to fill our dreams and desires, yet only after we seek first the kingdom of God. So we start this by loving God and his people more than ourselves, right? And that is the key. And so gratitude makes one rich, right? If you can, if you can have gratitude at what you have, as small as it is, it makes you rich, okay? And so when we look at the world, it's easy. Believe me, I, I, I have moments, I do. When I look at somebody, I was like, man, I wish I could have X, Y, Z. That'd be nice to have. Totally. I'm just admitting it. I do. You know, I'm just trying to be honest with y'all. But at the same time, God goes, Lance, gratitude will make you rich. Count your blessings. Because here's the thing. Most people have a lot and they're not happy. You can have a little and be happy. It's up to you. It's up to you on what you do with your heart, with your mind, how you think about things, how you look at things, all right? And so we have to be willing to look at life differently than the world is teaching us. And it's not wrong to be blessed with possessions. It's not wrong to have nice things. None of that is wrong. I'm not talking against people being wealthy. I'm just talking about our priorities and how we handle our wealth, right? But here's the thing. We can be rich in, in the things of God and dirt poor in the things of the world. But guess what? The richness of God will go with you forever. You'll never lose that. Everything here on earth will burn and be gone one day. And let's, I'm just going to ask you right now. How many times, I've done it, how many times have you guys really wanted something, spent a lot of money on something, got something, and it made you happy for a little bit? But after a couple weeks, a couple months, it doesn't bring the same joy. It doesn't bring the same happiness. Right? And so what do we have to do? Well, well I'm going to go buy something else that makes me happy. And then we just keep this cycle going. But I'm going to tell you what provides lasting happiness. One, loving God. Two, loving your fellow man. You want long-term personal happiness? You want to do something selfish? Love somebody. Sacrifice for somebody. Don't devote yourself to the benefits of other people. I promise you, Jesus knew this. The disciples knew this. God knows this, right? Because there's long-term return on it, right? And so relationships are hard. They're, they're tough, but people are worth it. And it's not always easy. But in the long run, people kill themselves to get a nice house, right? But most people in marriage won't kill themselves to keep their marriage alive, right? Right? And so that's where we have to break our mindset from the Western culture. So at the top of page three, let's read. Our American mentality is skewed by our own country's prosperity. The American dream is based upon the American lie. You can have it all now and you can get it on credit. This wage slave debt cycle of getting all you can and then slaving to keep all you have is the enemy of brotherly love and the spreading of the gospel. Jesus warned us in the following verse. 
No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Matthew 6, 24. I'm going to keep reading. The love of money and what it can give us as a tool to fulfill our desires is a knife to our own necks. It is impossible to have a split heart for money and for the will of God and still truly love the body of Christ. We're not talking about meeting our basic needs. We're talking about the never-ending thirst for more. More fun, more things, more cars, more clothes, more, more, more. Then the burden of trying to maintain and keep all we have gathered in our storehouses. It brings such burden that most find it difficult to have enough emotional and spiritual energy to be outward focused and sacrificially serve the body of Christ. The American dream unrefrained becomes the American suicide filled with torment and frustration where we are all experiencing different levels of the American poison, right? I am, everybody is. And it's something we have to break in ourselves. I'm going to keep reading. A godly life brings huge profit to people who are content with what they have. We didn't bring anything into the world and we can't take anything out. As long as we have food and clothes, we should be satisfied. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Godly advice right there. Godliness with contentment is great gain, basically. In other words, this is what we talked about earlier. So what does the Bible say? With food and clothes, be content. Does it mean you can't have a dream for a nice, like for me, I have a, a guitar I'd love to have. Doesn't mean God doesn't want you to have dreams or doesn't want you to think something would be nice to have. It's okay, right? But I can't put that desire so far up my pecking order that I am now hurting my brothers and sisters in Christ so I can attain that goal before I help them, right? That is a sin beyond sin. With, with this biblical mentality of being satisfied with our basic needs that our Father knows we need, it frees us up to focus on the needs of our fellow man and the spreading of the gospel. Love in its very core is sacrificial. Next verse. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy 6.10 now, most people are not greedy, slobbering fools, breaking every law to get rich, right? But we'll most likely find our evil roots spreading around the soul of everyone. Ideas and thoughts that feed into a double mind, creating the environment internally of a struggle between self-gratification and self-sacrifice. Like two versions of self battling out for control over what direction we'll take. Selfishness or sacrifice. I have it. You have it. We all have it. We have to recognize that we have it to overcome it, Right? Next verse. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his high position, and the rich in that he is made humble, because like the flower in the grass he will pass away. For the sun arises with scorching wind and withers the grass, and the flower in it falls in the beauty of it. Uh, next top of page four, a beauty of its appearance perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is a person who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life with the Lord promises to those who love him. James 1, 8 through 12. Right? Keep reading. The self-sacrificial individual will be blessed in their self-control, freeing them to fully love God and man by being content first with our basic needs being met and then trusting God to fulfill our dreams and desires. And he does want to do that, guys. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. That self-seeking, selfish individual will become puke out of God's mouth. The good news is we can ride our ships if we fall into this category or cut off any root and our hearts trying to spring up to prevent us from living the self-sacrificing life. This is not only pleasing to God, but also is the calling of every Christian. So let's read. It says, but since you are lukewarm and not hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich and wealthy and have need of anything. Yet you, you do not realize you're miserable, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I advise you buy gold purified in the fire for me so that you may be rich. Buy white clothes for me. Wear them so that you may keep your shameful naked body from showing. Buy anointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. Take this seriously and change the way you think and act. Basically, repent. Revelations 3, 16 through 19. Right? And so, I'm going to go ahead and just keep reading until we get to the bottom. The, re the reason we have spent so much time focusing on this tragic spiritual trick of the devil is because it is so prevalent in Western culture. If we want to be able to truly fulfill the scriptures we are about to read, we must break the Western mindset and all of its subtle lies about life. 
We do this by realigning our thoughts and hearts to the God's way of seeing life and its true meaning. We must search out all roots of selfishness and let God pull them up by the roots. Here we go. If we can only offer our leftovers to the body of Christ, then how can we honestly tell God we love him and the family of God? Right? And so Western culture, that's what it does. Get all you can. If you got anything left over, do that. Right? But the thing is, is we max out everything we have. We'll get more. We'll get a nicer car. We'll get a bigger house. We'll go on bigger vacations. It just doesn't end. We'll just moor ourselves into oblivion. That's what Americans do. It will drown under a sea of debt and think we made the American dream happen. But like I said earlier, it's the American poison. It's American suicide, right? And so we can't allow ourselves to be that way. So what does that mean? That means we have to either live at our, under our means, basically. We have to live at, in such a way, if we live under our means, that it frees us up to bless and benefit and, and stuff. So if we're working so f hard at our jobs, which is not wrong to work hard at your jobs, but if it gets you to the point where you have to neglect your family and then neglect the raising of your children, neg neglect your friends, right, and your church family, that's too hard. God never told you to do that. No, he didn't say to do that. He said do the exact opposite, right? But see, the thing is, is that when God blesses your work and you got it in the right priority, your one step is like 10 steps because God's blessing is upon it. But without his blessing, your 10 steps become one step. Right, because you're being stunted because the spiritual headwind you're head, uh, pushing into, and that's why some people can climb the chain all their lives and just tread a treadmill and never feel like they're getting anywhere. All right, remember, together you are the church, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1 22 through 23. Next verse, and again, I say to you, if Two of you agree on earth about anything they ask. It will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For are two or three gathered in my name, they, there am I among them. Matthew 18, 19 through 20. So we make up the body of Christ. We make up the church that we can come together and spiritually have this power that we cannot normally have on ourselves about binding and gathering and enjoining with God and have God come and be with us, right? And so this is why the body of Christ is so important and why we have to take care of each other. Okay. Next one, encourage each other. And let us take the thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, or some are in the habit of doing so, but encouraging each other. Even more so, so because you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. So part of the body of Christ, our goal is to encourage, to uplift, to cheer each other on, especially in our faith and our walk with God, right? To spur each other on to do that which is right or those good works, those things that God, you know, called us to. And not forsake the, the Bible study, not forsake the ability to go to church, not forsake the, the assembling of yourselves together. We need each other, desperately need each other, okay? Next one, remain in unity so that your praise will have power. It says, now may the God of endurance and comfort give you unity with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God of uh, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, receiving one another just as Christ also received you to his glory, right? Romans 15, 5 through 7. So what does it say? Endurance and comfort and give uh, give you your, uh, unity, right? In other words, same heart towards God, same mindset, same goals, right? It's like a football team or a sports team. If everybody is on the playing field trying to have their own personal goals trying to be met and not reaching the main goal, Right. They're, they're not going to win the game. Right. And so as Christians, as a body, as we're as one, as we're in unity, that we have the same focus, the same draw on our hearts to please God, to take care of one another. This is what God wants. Right. Next one. For the one who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by people. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for building up one another. Romans 14, 18 through 19. Right. Peace, unity, building each other up, encouraging each other. These are the things that God has called all of us to do. So we have to do it on a daily basis. Now, again, we can't do this if we just shrink away our entire lives and not get involved with each other's lives and not help take, burden each, uh, take each other's burdens, right? And so we have to always be outwardly focused towards what's going on as the mainstream of our life, and so we'll just clarify to make it easier, as the overall map of your life, okay? So if therefore there is any exhortation in Christ, if any consolation love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassion, may make my joy full by being like-minded, 
having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, doing nothing through rivalry or through conceit, but in humility, each counting others better than himself. Each of you not just looking out to his own things, but each of you also to the things of others. Have this in your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 1 through 5, right? So we are called, right, to be full of joy, right? Having the same mind, same love, being of one accord, doing nothing out of rivalry or exalting ourselves, humbling ourselves to each other, counting each other's better, and not just worrying about our own issues and problems in life, but worrying about each other's, right? And so there's a devilish trick, right? Because, you know, we we're talking a second ago. Well, worry, you got to take care of yourself. You do got to take care of yourself. But you see people that get so consumed with themselves that they go into this like weird funk and depression with that they never get out of it, Right? They're so attached to their own problems. They're so me focused. And I'm telling you, you want to break that. You need to get outwardly focused. I promise you, I'm telling you, it's the way out. It's the way that will help you grow and break that demonic burden. Doesn't mean again that you don't have times or periods in your life. We all do. I've had them. Everybody's had them, right? But we don't stay in them. We have to progress out of them. If we want to be of any use to God and to the body of Christ and to live the lifestyle that he would want us to live. Okay. So a mark of true Christian unity it says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good and the love of the brothers be tenderly affectionate to one another and honor preferring one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, enduring in trouble, continuing steadfastly in prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, given to the hospitality, Bless those who persecute, bless and don't curse, rejoice when those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Don't set your mind on high things, but, uh, but associate with the humble. Top of page six. It says, don't be wise in your own conceit. Repay no evil for evil. Respect what is honorable in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much it is up to you, be at peace with all men. Don't seek revenge yourselves, uh, beloved, but give place to... Uh, but give place to God's wrath. For his written, vengeance is my, uh, belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If the, he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in do, so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 9 to 21. And so there's a lot in there. So I'm not going to try to re-highlight everything, but it's like a basic blueprint on how to prefer one another, exalt each other, live in unity, have the same goals in mind, right? So the goal of this Bible study should be to learn how to live a godly life, to do that which is pleasing to God, right? And to understand him more. That's the whole goal of this Bible study, right? Why? So we can make disciples and turn around and do the same thing for somebody else, right? So we have to take what we're being taught here and turn around and teach somebody else the same thing. And that's how the gospel is spread around the world, right? And so we have to remain in these concepts. Uh, next one, restoring each other in faith. Brothers, even if a man is caught in some fault or sin, you who are spiritual must restore such a person in spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself that you're also not tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each man examine his own works, and then he'll have reason to boast in himself and not in someone else. For each man will bear uh, his own burden, but him who is taught in the word share all good things with him who teaches. Galatians 6, 1 through 6, right? So if we find each other stumbling in the faith, falling back, having an error in our lives, it is the godly loving thing to do to go, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, I see you're struggling with something. Can I pray with you? Right. This is gentle. This is not hellfire and brimstone. This is giving people time to recognize what they're doing and be able to respond in a, in a, a positive manner. Right. And so we're we're called to do that. Right. So we have to always be looking out because I'm my, my brother's keeper. Yes, you're your brother's keeper. I, absolutely. We have to be looking out for each other. The Bible clearly says it right here. I have to look out for you. You have to look out for me. Right. And then we have to continue in that in that gentleness and that fellowship to bear each other's burdens, lift each other's up, and not allow ourselves to fall into sin while we do it, okay? Therefore, putting away falsehood, speak truth to each other with, with his own neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sin sun go down on your wrath, and don't give place to the devil. Ephesians 4, 25-27, right? And so, it's okay to have moments when you don't disagree with a brother or sister in Christ. It's okay to have contention, 
right? Conflict is not always a bad thing, right? Conflict can produce a lot of beautiful changes in people's lives, right? If conflict becomes a bad thing, you know, even in a marriage or in a business and stuff, if it's held over into um, uh, unforgiveness, if it's held over where there's no growth, if it, it creates a burden or a wall, right? But conflict can be a very positive thing in a relationship. And so we don't want to say that you should always avoid conflict. No, Jesus didn't avoid conflict, right? Jesus was all up in people's business in, in order to affect change, right? With the right spirit and stuff. But when, as brothers and sisters of Christ, we can't be angry with one another. We can't be sitting there harboring unforgiveness towards one another or, or putting a, a burden on somebody that will never let them go. Same thing for marriages, same thing for business, right? We have to be able to forgive. Okay. Uh, bless and be enduring. Finally, all of your uh, be harmonious, sympathetic, affectionate, uh, compassionate, and humble. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead bless, uh, bless others because you were called to inherit a blessing. First Peter 3, 8 through 9, right? So firmly, be endearing, affectionate, compassionate, humble, right? Draw people to the be, put on the fruits of the spirit, love, peace, gentleness, you know, faithfulness, all these things. This is what we have to do for each other, right? And that way it is easy to interact with each other. It's easier to communicate with each other and it doesn't feel like a, this battle. Okay. Next one. So confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person can, has great effectiveness. James 5, 16, right? So if you're caught in a fault or you're failing in something, right? It's okay to talk to a brother and sister in Christ that you trust, you know, and uh, you have to be willing to find those people that you know that they're not going to go blab behind your back and say evil things about you or, or spill your beans, you know, but it's okay. Cause like I, I've talked to people all the time and they tell me stuff that they're struggling with and I never repeat it. I pray with them and I lift them up and, I, and then I try to hold them accountable. I'm like, how you doing on this type of stuff? Right. And that's what we're called to do. Okay. Next one, advise, admonish, and correct. But exhort one another each day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may become hardened by sin's deception. Hebrews 3.13, right? So exhort. So that's like to teach. They're like encourage. Like, hey, stop that doing that, you know? And that way uh, we don't see somebody in sin. Like in culture and church now, it's almost considering like, oh, they're dealing with their sin. They're, they're in adultery. We just got to love them. That's not love. Love is saying, listen, you're in a bad spot. You're, you're in a bad spiritual condition. You know, you are caught up in sin, and if you don't repent of the sin, it's going to have a negative impact on your relationship with God and, and your life. All right? That's love. You know, ignoring people's sin and faults and failures is not love. Right? We can cover a multitude of sins through love, but it, we have to, as a brother or sister of Christ, hold each other accountable. Okay? Next one. So we exhort you, brothers, admonish the disorderly. Right? And those people in trouble. Encourage the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Be patient towards all. See that no one returns evil for evil to anyone. But always follow after which is good for one another and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus toward you. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things and hold firm to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole soul, our spirit, soul, and body be preserved by at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 23, right? So exhort, admonish, right? So if someone's caught in your sin, you're supposed to be like, hey, brother, we're failing. We got, we, what can I do for you? Can I pray for you? I'm here for you. You know, we don't go in there and beat them over the head and make them feel horrible about it. But we have to be like, come on, there's, we got an issue, right? Next one, encourage the faint heart and support the weak, right? Those who are failing in their faith, who have fallen back, who don't feel like God is near, who are having a hard time struggling in their walk. We're supposed to build them up, right? Okay, top of page seven. We kind of talked about this earlier, okay? It says, become a servant to each other. I'll reread it. The culmination of all things is near. So be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of prayer. Above all, keep your love for one another fervent because love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without complaining, just as each one has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of the varied grace of God. 1 Peter 4, 7-10. So we talked about our spiritual gifts are for others, right? And here you have good gifts. Use it to serve one another, right? So all these verses is outward, like, you know, 
we're, we're, our focus as a happy, healthy uh, Christian is to support, to encourage, right? And so our love can cover a multitude of sins. In other words, you look past the fences. You don't sit there and try to hold stuff over people's heads, right? But we have to be sober-minded, right? And be stewards and, and, and servants to each other, right? And to lower ourselves down, right? Next verse. For you, brothers, we were called for freedom. Only don't use your freedom to gain the, uh, to the flesh, but through love be servants to one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourselves. Galatians 5, 13 through 14, right? So again, we are called to be servants, to serve, to be outwardly focused, to encourage other people, to build each other up, right? To the level in which we can, of course, right? But I guarantee you, if you're struggling with your own stuff, the quicker and the faster you can start helping other people, the quicker and faster you're going to find growth in your life. Because we talked about it before. When you're ministering in the Holy Spirit and God is guiding you and giving you the strength to do it, if you're if you're not being a cup, where you're just trying to take whatever God's and keep it to yourself, but you become a pipe, you get blessed by what's flying by you to the other person. I promise you. I've experienced it all the time. Right? And so we can't be a cup. Right? We have to be the pipe. We have to be the, the conduit. And then we get the fullness of God's power and strength. We get the ability to grow in our own faith and our own walks. Right? And so we have to remember to do that. And so next one, submit to each other in the fear of God. Therefore, consider carefully how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, taking advantage of every opportunity because the days are evil. For this reason, do not be foolish, but be wise by understanding what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for each other in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, or, uh, and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, right? And so we have to always be submitting to one another, exalting each other up, praying, encouraging. We need each other, right? When God has not called us to just be hermits in a mountain somewhere by ourselves. You know, I could do that. I just, in my mentality, I believe me, I could do that. But it's hard to minister to people when there's nobody around. Right. And so we have to be outwardly focused. We sacrifice ourselves for the body of Christ. We bear our cross daily. We learn to deny ourselves. Right. We die for each other in the body of Christ. This is what God is telling us to do. OK. And now it's a learning process. It doesn't happen overnight, but we have to start those steps. We have to start making those moves. We have to start stretching ourselves personally out of our comfort zone. Right. And so as long as we can start that process and not resist the process, then God will take care to make sure we're doing it on his time, his schedule and his way. Right. But we have to be willing to partake in that process. Be kind and long suffering with each other. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, outcry and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God also in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4, 30 to 32, right? So we're called to love, be kind, suffer, take the hit, take some abuse, right? If we always stood up on our rights, they're like, well, that's just not right. I'm not going to let you do that, right? All we're doing is playing into the cycle of the devil and it can be perpetuated. So Jesus took the ultimate hit. He took all the shame, all the regret, all the rejection, all the things we deserve. Things he never deserved. And he still took the hit. And as the Bible says, the lamb that went to a slaughter, he didn't rebuke it, it, you know, like, hey, guys, why are you doing this to me? You know, he just took it. Right. And so that's our example. We're supposed to take some pain. We're going to take some abuse. It's part of it, guys. OK, I'm just telling you right now. It's not fun. It's not easy. But sometimes you just have to take it in love. And so God will bless you for it. God will uplift you and exalt you in it. God will encourage you. You'll feel I've never felt closer to God than when I was being persecuted. I'm just telling you right now, because God will take special care of you. He comes to you and, and lets you feel his presence to strengthen you. Right. And so when you take the hit and you suffer and you, you suffer lack and you do without so other people can benefit. Believe me, same thing. First of all, he gives you a heart of gratitude so you can appreciate what you do have. Second of all, his spirit will rest upon you so you can do it with joy and you know you're doing it for him. Right. Because ultimately, if I do it. And anything I do for you guys, I'm doing for Christ, right? And so anything you do for me, you're doing for Christ right? or each other, okay? So share the necessary provisions to those in need. 
By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we have to lay down our lives for the brothers. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart of compassion against him, how does God's love remain in him? My little children, let us not love in word only, also, or with the tongue only, but in deed and truth. First John three sixteen through 18. So we find this ultimate sacrifice in the book of Acts, where everybody sold all their possessions to provide for all the Christians because the persecution, everything that was going on, you know, people are getting losing their jobs, losing their houses, getting, and they're running and fleeing, right? And so they gave all they had communally. It doesn't mean it always works, but the concept is this. You have to be willing to share what you have, right? To the point it hurts, not to the point of, hey, I'm just going to give you my leftovers, but to the point it hurts. This pleases God. Just like with the widow's mite, she gave to the point it hurts. Jesus said that is literally all she had to live on. That means as soon as she dropped the two mites, she had no m money for food. That's it. Right? Jesus didn't admonish her like, you crazy lady, why didn't you keep it for yourself and buy yourself some food? No, he said, there is not a single person who's given more than this lady to the kingdom of heaven. That's what that is. Right? And so... Just like with us in this ministry, me and my wife have agreed that we have literally gave everything uh, up to this point. I think we spent thirty eight thousand uh, dollars. My bank account, my my savings accounts about wiped. And so that's it. I, we've given everything. Now, if I was just looking out for me, this wouldn't be happening. We wouldn't be having this Bible study. This is truth. I could have paid off all my debt, got a new vehicle, which I desperately need. But no, what if, what if me and my wife decided God wanted us to do? To put every single one of you guys first, before us, even before our family, to help take care of you guys, to, to, to invest into you, and it, with the hope that you guys will see the value of it and invest into our family. But somebody has to take the hit. This doesn't happen if, you know, God doesn't put it on our hearts that, hey, Lance, I'm, you're, it's your turn. You're going to take the hit now. And then I had to make a decision. Am I taking that hit? We, we, yes, Lord, I'll take the hit because I trust God. He'll see us through it. Right. But ultimately, it's an act of love towards you. Every single one of you. That's what it is. It's God putting it on my heart to sacrifice my own personal well-being and family's well-being to love you. That's the gospel. Right. And so if it, and, and it encourages you guys in your heart to do the same for me and for other people. And this is how the love of Christ is spread around the world. And this is how it's always been since the beginning of, uh, of Jesus' ministry. They all left their jobs and, and wandered after Jesus. People sold their houses and belongings to fund the ministry. This is how it works. And I, I believe in it. And so, you know, I just want to say, every one of you guys are worth it. No matter what happens, every one of you are worth it. Because you are made in the image of God. You're a child of God. You deserve to be loved. You deserve someone to sacrifice for you. All right? Amen. So what is it? Next one. What good is it? My brother and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works, can this kind of faith save them? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do not give them what, uh, give them what the body needs, what good is it? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead by being by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. James 2, 14 through 18. Listen, guys, true faith, true trust in Jesus Christ costs you something. And it will cost you dearly. Because it will get you to a position when you walk with God that to show your true trust and faith in Jesus Christ, it's going to knock down some things you have in your life. Right? Like one of the things that I always wanted, because I, I basically moved every year of my life because of my mom uh, in the lifestyle we lived, uh, was a house that my kids can grow up in that we didn't move every year of life. It was one of the hardest things to do starting this ministry to put that on the altar with God that like there might come a day that this house goes bye bye. But I'm willing to do it because I love Christ. Right. And so what did David say when they're talking about building the tabernacle for God and they want uh, him and they want to give him the threshing floor? Right. And they're going to give him free. He's like, no, far be it. it, it it's going to cost me something like I refuse to not let it cost me something because then you have skin in the game. Then it means something. God responds to that. Right. And so we have brothers and sisters in this body. Right. Who are suffering or dealing with lack and we're not actively participating in taking care of them. 
then we have failed the gospel commission. We have failed God. It's just that really that simple. Right. And so, and I don't say this part to like, yay me, but again, I, I'm just giving you examples in my own life to let you know, I'm, I, this is active in my life. I'm not preaching to you something I'm not doing. I had a friend who ran out of groceries. I, do you guys know my financial situation? We offered to buy them groceries. I'm at a point now that basically to stretch this out as far as long ago, we, we're not buying groceries for the next three months. That's where we're at. You know, trying to make it last. You know, and but at the same time, do I do I bind up my heart to another human being and not do something for them when I can? How hateful would that be? How would I deny Christ by not doing that? I couldn't pray at night. I couldn't ask God to bless anything I had. And I'm just being honest because it's the truth. Our culture sucks. Our communities are broken. Our fellowship with Christ is based upon meeting our own needs and not the needs of other people. And it's sin. And it has to stop. There is no hope for the body of Christ. If we're always looking out for ourselves, if we're so inwardly focused that we don't know how to sacrifice and put ourselves on the altar for Christ, that is the truth. And I defy any one of you to deny that. Because guess what? You're going to make yourself an enemy of God. And you have to humble yourself and look before God in Christ and ask him honestly, are you doing what is pleasing to him? Or are you just pleasing yourselves? I have to, you have to. I have to do it every single day. Every day I wake up and look at my kids and my wife. It takes everything to be faithful. It's not easy. But that is the Christian walk. It's not meant to be easy. It's hard. God, Jesus promised you will have tribulations. It will be a struggle. But then you know you're doing it right because it's ripping everything apart of you. You're not having this like Shangri-La experience in this life. Trying to get close to God. You can fight tooth and nail to draw next to him. You lay away beside every single weight you have that's keeping you from walking forward. You don't play games with him. You don't take the gospel as if it's trash or it's easy or the death of Jesus became an easy thing to throw away. That it didn't cost him his son. That Jesus didn't die for you. We're getting so wrapped up in sin and things that hold us back from Christ. Why do we not value it? Why do we not look at it as the single most important thing ever to exist in our entire life? And why can we not honor Christ and God in the manner in which he wants us to? It's selfishness. It's exalting ourselves. If you want brotherly love, you have to lay it all down, period. You can disagree with me, that's fine. You're disagreeing with Christ, not me. There's not one Bible verse in the Bible that tells you to seek your own. Period. Nothing. All I read is, Lance, you're going to follow me. It's going to hurt. It's going to cost you. It'll be worth it in the end. I will give you more than you give me. But it starts with you giving me what you have. And what do I have? I have my life. I have everything God gave me, my wife and my kids and everything I own. And I've put it out there. I'm not asking any one of you to do anything I'm not doing. But don't let the devil trick you. Don't let him fool you. Don't let him get him sidetracked with stupid arguments and splitting hairs. Because you're just being deceived. 
Because the Bible clearly says what we just read it said. Deny yourself. Die for one another. Bear each other's burdens. Sacrifice. Give. And in that, you can please God. Top of page 8. The grand summation of applying love. Greater love has no man than this. That someone lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. You want the love of Christ? You want to love each other? You want to please God? Die for each other. Die for me. I'm trying to die for you. I'm trying to die for everyone I know, to my wife and my kids. That means I put my wants and my desires secondary. Thought that I don't have them. It's just I do not let them get in the way of accomplishing the goal. Next one. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James 4, 17. If you know something you're supposed to be doing for Christ right now and you're not doing it, and you know it's the right thing to do, you're sinning. And that is hindering your prayers. I promise you that. You need to do what you know you need to do. If it's reconciling relationships, if it's doing things better in your family, if it's getting your priorities reorganized and reordered to be pleasing to God, you need to do it. You need to stop playing games with God. You're going to take God's patience and mercy as some pitiful thing that you could just come and take and go and leave. The Bible says God's spirit will not always bear with man and that you can grieve the Holy Spirit and that you can walk away from him. Stop playing games. Do what's right. Recap. We must all live a self-denial lifestyle as we follow the example of Jesus by seeking first the kingdom of heaven and allowing God to fulfill our desires on his timetable. We do this by being obedient to God in love. Then we fulfill the calling of all Christians to love the body of Christ more than ourselves. This can only be done by sacrificing ourselves for the benefit of others. Nothing short of a sacrificial lifestyle for the kingdom of God can produce the fruit of brotherly love. Therefore, we must all search out every root of self-gratification and place it at the feet of God. We must not try to retain for ourselves any pleasure that God himself is unwilling to give back to us. Trusting God to fulfill our desires, dreams, and hopes. As we smash the idols of selfishness and exalt the well-being of others over ourselves, we will create uh, the environment ready to receive the best blessings the Lord can provide. The evil trick of the devil is to try to convince us that this type of sacrifice will lead to want, lack, and not being happy. But this is not true. Just like any good marriage, when all parties are solely concerned for the well-being of the other, then instead of being one person trying to meet your own needs, you have an army of people looking out for you, trying to meet your own uh, meet your needs. This power in numbers is what the devil wants to hide from you and prevent you from ac uh, assess accessing. The only problem is that it has to start with someone. Are you willing to be the one who will continue to take it to the next level and lead by example. I pray every one of you guys are. I pray every single one of you have some conviction in your heart. I, I pray that you are so disturbed with yourself right now that God is doing something in your mind, in your heart, and you don't like it and you want to resist it and you want to create excuses and reasons and arguments. That's great. That's where you want to be. That's God talking to you. That's God taking up the dirt, you know, and putting that shovel in there and that heart and opening it up. That's growth. It's not fun. It's not easy, right? It doesn't bring a happy joy. This is not, this is not a Joel Olstein sermon. I'm going to tell you, you're all going to be rich and get a promotion. I'm telling you, you're going to be rich and get a promotion in God's kingdom. That you're going to grow in God. You're going to grow in Christ. And you're going to be lifted up. You'll be counted great and high and honorable in the kingdom of heaven. But you have to do it Jesus' way. That's self-sacrificing. Taking the hit. Again, so we're not confused. It's not means we don't take care of ourselves. But we never take care of ourselves at the cost of taking care of others as a long-term goal in our life. This is pleasing the Christ. This is pleasing the God. So um, I'm going to pray. And if anybody has any arguments or discussions or questions, I'll be up for it. So let's do that. Let's go and pray, Daniel. Daniel, pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for your love and many blessings. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for allowing us to understand your way of doing things is not the world's ways. It's not the ways that bring happiness. It's not the ways that give us joy and peace in life. It's the ways that destroys us. I rebuke that destruction away from me and everybody in this group. I rebuke those spirits that cloud our hearts and minds and our culture, Father, that just 
come against your ways and your wills of doing things. I break them now in the name of Jesus Christ. As for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to fill the void, that you comfort our hearts and minds in the Spirit, Father, that you give us strength and energy and perseverance to accomplish your goal and to do what is pleasing in your sight, and that it will bring honor to Christ and honor to your name, and that the world will see the difference in us, that we love one another, and that they will know we are your disciples, and we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. Brotherlance.com